Well, all right. Here is a little thought experiment on this uh, sweet, sunny June Sunday. If, uh, if an acquaintance of yours, um, in the middle of casual conversation about whatever, um, happened to turn the topic gently toward religion, uh, first of all, would you hang in there at all, or would you just say, oh, oh geez, i got to go? <laughs> but what, what if that person were to say, well, you know, we're in the middle of a huge religious revival here in North America. You can see signs of it all over. What would be your reaction to that person? Cold, yeah. <laughs> Disagreement. Nah. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Huge religious revival. You can see signs of it all over. Come on now. Churches are struggling. They're closing. They're shrinking all over. No, come on. What are you talking about? Thing is, that acquaintance of yours would be absolutely right. Absolutely right. We in Canada and the United States and Western Europe and other places are, in fact, in the middle of a religious revival, hallelujah. It's just that the movements um, that are rising aren't what we church-going folks would normally call religion. I think there are three spiritual movements that can be identified as, as surging these days, reviving, reviving in surprising ways. Um, now, I only have uh, numbers for the United States, but I think they can be extrapolated into Canadian society at least urban and suburban Canadian society to some extent. Um, anybody want to take a guess what these three movements are? These three movements of this, of, uh, that, are, that are surging? Spirituality. Spirituality rather than religion. That's, that's a good one, yeah. Home churches. Home churches. Oh, that's very good. Wouldn't that be sweet? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm not going to make any judgment calls on these things or assign any judgment to these, but merely identify them. One of the first and most uh, active uh, religious revivals is astrology. Yeah, astrology. According to an eight, uh, a 2018 Pew poll, uh, again, in the United States, 30% of Americans say that they believe in astrology. Well, it doesn't sound like much 30% support Trump, too. Um, <laughs> but when you think of it, 30% of, uh, of the size of the United States, that's a, just a whole lot of people. It's more than our members of mainline Protestant churches. 44% say that astrology is somewhat or very scientific. Un unsurprisingly, online horoscopes uh, are, are just booming getting far more sites than our website is. <laughs> so what else? That's one of them. Here's another one. Neo-paganism. Wicca. Witchcraft. The occult. It's just growing leaps and bounds. There are over a million people, again, these are just uh, U.S. figures, over a million who identify uh, as witches, neo-pagans, or occultists. They have different names. Now, these are very, very broad categories, and there's a whole lot of wiggle room in those designations. But it's surging. I mean, not like Salem-type uh, witchcraft, but neo-paganism. A return to nature, a return to uh, that which is not orthodox. A third identifiable movement sounds a little less spooky, and it's close to what Ray said. It, it's, it's mindfulness or wokeness, which is a newly coined word. Wokeness is a wonderful thing. Waking up to what's really there, including um, long-standing uh, ossified uh, abuse of minorities and women. A waking up to what's really there, good and bad, beautiful or ugly. Mindfulness is kind of a hodgepodge spirituality, borrowing practices from, say, uh, 
uh, indigenous uh, and uh, Bud uh, Buddhist cultures and traditions, and blending them in a way that many people find helpful or me you know, moving or, uh, or beautiful. But it is what is growing these days. So why are these things, we've got to ask ourselves, why are these things that have been taught to churchgoers from an early age, uh, particularly if you grew up in a, in a more evangelical or fundamental type church, these things would be considered foreign or creepy or just plain evil, right? So why are they growing? And why aren't there a thousand people in here today? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know is my first answer, which is always the first answer. But, but here, here's some thoughts. I, I, I think part of it is because organized religion of all flavors just doesn't seem to be delivering the goods. There's a vast and deep spiritual yearning ab among all human beings, no matter where they're from or who they are, and has been since the very beginning of humanity on this earth. And people are looking for a way to be spiritual. Looking for a way to be spiritual. People are always saying that we live in a more secular age. You've, you've read this, heard this, maybe you've even said it. But the, even in the most secular parts of our society, there is a great and unfulfilled spiritual yearning. There's also a need to express alienation. Remember back in the 1950s, there was a movie uh, called the, the Rebel. And somebody said, what are you rebelling against? And the answer was, I think it was Marlon Brando said, what do you got? <laughs> it's kind of like that. I mean, interest in stuff like the occult surfaces during periods of transition, periods of disillusionment. It happened in the late 1960s, you all remember, uh, and it's happening again today. For younger people, meaning people younger than me, um, for younger people, organized religions are part of the power structure, part of the establishment, as we used to say back in the 60s, the establishment. So following neo-paganism or following Wicca, is a way to announce that you stand on the fringe of society, that you stand against the majority culture, against the structures of oppression and abuse. Now, we can see this in politics all the time, with both far right, far right and far left movements in countries all over the world. And it makes sense that it would show up in the spiritual realm as well. People are moving away from the center and out to the fringes to be something different than the establishment. And there's one more thing, I think. Um, we live at a time when many of the traditional sources of, uh, of, um, of identity, uh, ethnicity, uh, neighborhoods, various kinds of rootedness are, are disappearing. And you can see the backlash of this in the in the, the, the white supremacist movements and ugly stuff like that. So people are turning to things like astrology. Astrology purports to tell you who you are and what traits you have. Whether it does or not is an open question. And in a highly diverse society, it also tells you what sort of people you're likely to be compatible with and, uh, or incompatible with. Those are the answers people are looking for when people talk about astrology. That's kind of how they use it. Who's going to be my soulmate, my, uh, my life partner? Who are, who are my friends going to be? I'm looking for people whose uh, Mars is in the second house and Jupiter is aligning with whatever. Um, so as our new website becomes live uh, this coming week, I, I hope, um, <clears throat> What is it that we have to offer people? What is it that we have to offer people out there who aren't in here yet? What will keep our doors open as we reach our 70s, our 80s, 
or our 90s. <clears throat> well, I'd like to talk about that in kind of an oblique way. Um, I'd like to speak of the temperament <clears throat> of our message, uh, its nature, its character, its, uh, its mood, its, its metal, not precisely what we offer in programs and so forth, but what's the, what's the temperament of who we are and what we do here? What could that offer people? Well, the first up is the most obvious. We have this building. Most astrologers don't have a building. Uh, Neo-pagans don't have a, a building, you know, but we do. This quirky, not particularly accessible building. We've invested in, re in restoring the, uh, uh, you know, the architect's original modernist version of this place that's several buildings stuck together. We've invested in color and form and words and music that provide a setting for our message because we believe that God, whose thunder uh, sets the oak trees dancing, a wild dance, whirling, as the uh, leaves uh, leaf out around us today, causes human creativity to create community where, wherever it's given the, even the tiniest chance. And that creative uh, energy is intuitive. I mean, we're at home, or we're learning to be anyway, at home in the world of poetry and image and symbol and storytelling and, and a certain kind of ritual and also art of the musical, visual, literary, and uh, here especially culinary kinds. There's something very artistic about our garage sale, <laughs> I think. Uh, we know that God has placed this intuitive art making deep within us here. And it, 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 it's, if, if given a chance, it expresses, it pops right out and rather beautifully. Churches like ours have, already, have always resisted the temptation to align ourselves with the dogmas of the far right or the far left finding the richness of the spiritual life not to be in conformity or in creedal formulas, but in the inner life of intuition, spiritual inquiry, seeing with soul. That's a big part of who we are. Now, we use our minds, of course. We're both intuitive and thinking. We value both spiritual inquiry and intellectual freedom. Churches like ours believe in good scholarship. And going back to the original sources of the scriptures, for example, we value a questing and a questioning faith. We, we don't dumb anything down here. We don't seek to serve the lowest common denominator. We search for wisdom in a lot of places, applying our minds and our hearts to what we've encountered. And we work through the experience. We encourage people to listen to each other, which is, again, why we're seated this way, seated this way symbolically, and to bring their honest questions to their life journeys. We tend not to be black and white in our thinking, though that's easier to do, but we're, uh, we're pretty gray here, and I don't mean the color of our hair. And that's a wonderful thing. Gray is a very popular color these days. Even though our spiritual ancestors may have used terms like the one true church, uh, we most assuredly do not talk like that uh, because we're aware of how times change and how human thinking and human connections change. It's part of our great strength here. So we go with the flow. Where is soul? Where is it today? We need to find it and be a part of it. We avoid extremes believing that a life in the Spirit is one that is both inwardly graceful and inquiring and outwardly serving and responsible. We have both those things in balance. We also affirm the ambiguity of personal experience and the full breadth of human life. I mean, throughout Christ Christian history, which has often been pretty bloody, we've learned to listen to and evaluate differing opinions 
on the spiritual journey. It's hard to do. Not everybody does it. But we do. The United Church doesn't have 2,000 member churches. Because we don't do much cheerleading and rabble rousing. We do a little promotion. Again, we got a website, we got a newsletter, we got some print ads, we got some stuff like that. But we don't do much cheerleading, we don't do much rabble rousing. We may shout glory, as we did in our Psalm 29 call to worship, but that's not our main way of going about celebrating our connection to God. Not really. Now, this next point deserves a much longer development, but let me just throw it out there for now. Uh, Churches like ours have a reverence for nature and its rhythms, as our hymns have been all about this morning in, in in our scriptures. I mean, we, like other Christian belief systems, don't believe that human beings are above the created order, but very much a part of its delicate and intricate balance. Not every church believes that. Not every church acts that out. But we do. Care for the earth and reverence for life is woven in and through our way of being church. I think it would be very attractive to a lot of people if they only knew. And because of that sensitivity, we know that Christian life has an influence on public policy. I'm trying to avoid the word political here. Civic life is both a legitimate and an important place for our faith to be expressed. I mean, public policy not the horse race of partisan politics, but public policy is a legitimate and important focus of discussion and ministry, which is why we have our outreach speakers here every month, just to remind us what's going on outside our walls. Now, there's a lot more that could be said about all these things, but I want to get to the point that's the most important and the hardest to articulate. So let me just take a shot in the dark here about our church temperament. Churches like ours believe the truth can be found, that the divine can be experienced in exploring the creative tension between opposites. For example, we affirm both the sacred and the secular, the material and the spiritual. We don't reject anything. We affirm both the mind and the heart, transcendent glory and imminent intimacy. Both of those things. And the most striking scripture that illustrates this, uh, that I know about anyway, is in the book of Isaiah, uh, second Isaiah, that is, the, you know, the prophet of the Babylonian exile, who said that um, Israel should be comforted and to make, a, make straight in the desert a highway to return to Jerusalem. It's Isaiah uh, chapter 40. We, you know, we, we sing that in, uh, in Advent. But that Isaiah also speaks about how the Persian king Cyrus, uh, kind of an enlightened dictator back in the day, would be anointed by God to release the Jews from Babylon. And there is a gorgeous passage in chapter 47 in which God speaks to the pagan, moon-watching, polytheistic Cyrus and convinces him that it's the great I Am, the one God who's speaking to him. And then God says this to the Iranian king. Uh, George has this for us. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me, so that you may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is no one besides me. 
I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make weal and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. What a wonderful couplet that is. I form light and create dark. Wait a minute, we thought God was all light and heavenly and all that and fluffy clouds and stuff. No, I form light and create dark. I make wheel and create woe. That translator was really into alliteration there. Some translations say I make peace and create calamity. In the darkness... In the calamity, says this one God, treasure can be found. In the secret places, in the shadows, in the places where we as individuals and communities and nations like to hide it away. That's where the treasure is. In the darkness, in the shadow. That's where the gold is, as we're doing with the kids, where the Christmas lights can be seen. That's where the truth is, the power, the intense, unconditional love is in the darkness, in the shadow. And we can celebrate it with shouting glory and dancing like whirling oak trees, as our call to worship talked about, but it's in the shadowy pain. It's in the hidden things, the things that seem to be opposite and wrong that God has found, that the gem is set that the treasure lies. See, that's why churches like ours aren't particularly popular. No one really likes to look in the shadows or to be pulled by the the tension of the opposites. It's hard work. It can be painful. It's like going to the gym. Nobody likes to go to the gym. But that's the setting of our message. That's our temperament. Look where no one else is looking. That's where God is. That's where the treasure is. And it is a rare message indeed. Let's keep looking. The older we get, the easier it is to see the treasure. Amen.